take up about two hours if we do that. <laughs> but, but first of all, if I isolate Genesis and with Adam, I just talk about Adam. I'm talking about Adam in the context of the first book of the Bible. Now, we believe that the first book of the Bible, for example, the first three chapters, I believe are to be taken literal. They are inspired. They are the perfect and errant word of God. At the same time, we recognize that we interpret everything in the scriptures by the scriptures. So if I just look at Genesis and Adam's dealing with God and God's dealing with Adam after the fall, um, that's not going to give me a full blown biblical view of radical depravity of man. As I go on, first of all, I see in the end of Genesis three, I see Adam and Eve cast out of the garden. I do not hear much again until finally someone begins to call upon the name of the Lord much later. Something's going on there. I know that Adam's sons have a problem. I know that Adam was made in the image of God and then his sons are now made in the image of Adam. So I, I can see that something is happening there. Paul will go on and explain that to us in several chapters throughout the Bible about what it means for Adam to have fallen. So I can't just look at Genesis and say, aha, Adam could still talk to God afterwards or this happened this way. I have to take it in the context of everything that's also said in the epistles. When it's talking about Abraham in chapter four, believing God and it was accounted to him as righteousness, that's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. He believed God and God reckoned it unto him as righteousness, just like you believe the gospel and God saved you. But the question is, how does someone believe God when the great portion of the world? Well, let's just go. Let's make it a more even specific thing. Noah, I want you to think about Noah for a moment. Let's say that it's like the modern day people say that that uh, people make a choice to believe God. And then after as they believe God or believing God, they're born again. It's all about man's choice and that's it all about man's choice. If man chooses to believe, he believes if he doesn't, he doesn't. It's all about his choice now. Would you agree that Noah was an important person in God's redemptive history? Uh, let's just put it this way. If there w hadn't been a Noah, there wouldn't have been a Jesus. Do you see that? Everyone would have been destroyed. Now, I want you to think about this. Everything depends upon man's decision. Right? If man chooses not to believe, he doesn't believe. If he chooses to believe, well, wonderful, he chooses to believe. So, God, look, look at the position that puts God in. The whole world has become so utterly wicked, it must be destroyed. So now God is looking. I got to find someone who believes. There's no one I've looked at. I've let's say that there were one. There were one billion people on the planet. Well, I've looked at nine hundred and ninety nine million, nine hundred ninety nine thousand and and no one believes. I mean, my whole redemptive plan is 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 going to be destroyed. I mean, someone's got to believe someone's got to be a righteous man, because if they're not, I destroy the whole world. There's no redemptive plan. There's no cross. There's no. Oh, Noah. You've saved the day. Out of one billion people who would not believe, you believe, and now I can go ahead with my plan. Think about it. Now, logically, you can't you can't resist this argument. Everybody has refused to believe. Everybody is going to be destroyed. And if it's the way the modern evangelical world looks at it, Noah saved God. God finally found someone who would believe in him. Makes you kind of sad, doesn't it? Or 
Is it the way the ancients and the confessions and the creeds of the church? Is it the way the, the preachers we really respect like Spurgeon and Martin Lloyd-Jones and Jonathan Edwards and Whitfield and the Reformers and the Puritans, the men that we read and go, my goodness, how did they write like this? Could they be right? Noah did believe. Noah was a righteous man in that sense. Because God. God is the reason. The reason Noah believed is the same reason Abraham believed when he's in the midst of nothing but pagans and there weren't even any Jews. He was the first one. And God's the reason you believe. And all the glory goes to God. And so, yes, like I said, if you're here today and you're believing in Jesus, you chose to believe in Jesus. You did. But it was God who made you a new creature who would no longer choose to hate God and love evil, but to love God and hate evil. You see? And when we talk about that new nature, and again, I really need to get to evangelism. That's an excellent question that deserves like several hours. But someone came up to me afterwards with a question. Well, if I have a new heart, you know, why do I still have trouble with sin? Am I not a believer? Am I not? Is that we do have a new nature. We have a new heart. But there is an aspect of our being that's really hard to put our finger on. But it's called the flesh. Um, and it's, it's a bad thing. And in that is ingrained habits of sin. And there's a fight. And there will be a fight. We can win. And we can make great progress in godliness, but there will always be a battle until the day we step over into glory. And let me show you how it works just real quick. And then we're going to go on to the message. He's a lost man. And uh, it's snowing outside and he's late for work and he has an important meeting. He doesn't feel very good, doesn't have all his papers together, but he's He's got his briefcase, and as soon as he gets ready to go out the door, the briefcase opens up, falls on the kitchen floor. He's all upset, puts the papers back in, reaches for the doorknob, and right when he reaches for the doorknob, his wife comes downstairs with the big robe on and the fluffy slippers, and her hair looks like Medusa, kind of like a Yeti. And she screams at him and says, Can you take out the trash? <laughs> yeah. And immediately, he turns around, lost man that he is, and goes... You take out the trash. Don't you see it's snowing outside. I'm late for work. I got a meeting. I'm going to get fired. And you look like a Yeti. Take out the trash yourself. And he walks out the door totally and completely justified. She did. She looked like a Yeti. She shouldn't have bothered me. I got things to do. She's wrong. Goes to work. Goes to his meeting. Has no problem. Six months later, he's converted. And then six months later, it's snowing outside. He's late for a meeting. All his papers are falling out on the kitchen floor. He's nervous, pulls them all together, reaches for the doorknob to go out and get in the car. And his wife comes down the steps with the big fluffy slippers and the Medusa hair looking like a Yeti. And she says, take out the trash. And he goes, you take out the trash. Can't you tell that I'm late? Can't you tell? And you look like a Yeti. And you say, well, what's the difference? The moment he did it, it was like someone drove a knife through his heart. But he's mad. And so he resists. And he gets his papers together and he walks out the door and he gets in the car and he's miserable. He knows he's wrong, wrong, wrong. And he drives to work and he can't even hardly think about his meeting. He's got to go into the meeting. He goes in anyways thinking, I got to get this done. And then he stops and says, gentlemen, I'm, I'm sorry, I need to step out for a minute. And he picks up the phone and he goes. Honey, I, I'm sorry. I have sinned against you. I am so sorry. I can't live with myself. Why is that? He's a new creature. That's why. And then as he renews his mind 
and cult. Now, this never happens in my house. This is just something <laughs> that that I thought up, you know. Uh, Because it would, in my house, it wouldn't have ended there. I'd have been wearing a frying pan on my head. Because <laughs> my wife also needs to be sanctified. But, <laughs> no, I'm still alive, which is evidence I've never called her a Yeti. Um, but, do you see? I'm not making fun of sin or trying to make light of it, but that's an illustration to show you he's not the pig anymore. He can stick his head in the bucket. He can. But boy, the moment he tastes it, he knows it's filled. And he's a new creature. He can't live that way anymore. Now, it may it may get even riper. I mean, he may buck up against this even more. But then what happens? The providence of God. God may discipline him or it may even come to a point if he's in a biblical church that the elders of the church and the church itself have to move for his discipline. But if he's genuinely converted, he will repent and come back. Because he's a new creature. He's a new creature. Now, let's go to the message. And. First of all, look at look at Romans chapter one. Verse 16. Well, first of all, let's look at um, let, let's just go ahead and back up there to verse 14. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to foolish. So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who who are in Rome. Now. Greeks and barbarians, wise and foolish. Are different people groups. He may be talking about Jews and pagans. He just he's talking about different people groups. And the point that I want to make is I don't care what the people group is and I don't care what the culture is. They need the same gospel. And the reason why I say that is because missions, worldwide missions has become one of the greatest tragedies. Ever. And it's not because of a lack of missionaries or missionary activity. There's more missionary activity in the world today than ever. And a great part of it is just wrong. As a matter of fact, it'd be better if many missionaries just got on a boat, came back to their home and got a job working at a retail store. And I'm not talking about people who just disagree with me on a few things. I am talking about missions have lost missions has lost its mind. When I go to Indonesia and find Christian evangelical conservative missionaries telling Muslims that they are Muslim Christians now. When I see translating uh, ministries that are supposedly conservative saying that they must take all references to Jesus as the son and the father as the father out of the Bible because it's offensive to a Muslim. When I see prayer groups raised up called churches that are getting Muslims to pray to Jesus without telling them he's the incarnate God. Missionaries from the West, there are some missionaries on the field that are worth their weight in gold. There are some, if you want to know where all the liberalism went, went to the mission field. Pragmatism, hyper contextualization. It's horrific, horrific. Because what? Someone wants to be a missionary and the church goes, oh, wonderful. And they send them out to be a missionary. They don't even qualify to be a missionary. They got a good heart, bleeding heart, wear their heart on their sleeve, want to do something good. But they don't even understand the gospel. Nor how to teach people the scriptures or how to exegete the scriptures. R realize this missions is a theological endeavor. You understand me? It is. It's about teaching truth. That makes it a doctrinal and theological endeavor. And yet most mission agencies, what do they do? They ignore theology in order to do a theological endeavor. They reduce their statement of faith down to the lowest common denominator to include as many supporters and as many missionaries as possible. And they take theology and throw it out the door because it causes division. And so what do you have? 
you have missionaries who are teaching Muslims that Allah and Yahweh are the same God. That is prevalent. Okay? So, when Paul talks about the gospel, someone asked me one time, how do you preach the gospel to the Aguaruna tribe? And I said, I don't. I preach the gospel to men. I preach the gospel to men. And Paul doesn't wait three years to take them through the history of Israel before he preaches the gospel to them either. He preaches the gospel to them the first day. He doesn't just tell them stories. He tells them propositional truth. He's given a group of pagans and some Jews the book of Romans, which some of the greatest scholars in the world have spent their entire life trying to understand. So when we talk about preaching the gospel, I'm not talking about preaching the gospel to New Zealanders and, or, and then preaching the gospel to people from Australia and preaching a different gospel in Africa or changing it here and there and everywhere. Not at all. Preaching a singular same gospel. And what's amazing? The tribal people don't seem to have a problem with it. They understand it. It's the missionaries that have the problem. <laughs> you see that? So Paul talks about preaching the same gospel to all peoples. And then he says in verse 15, so for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. It's the only, only message. There is no other message. To do anything to the singular message of the gospel is high treason against the throne of God. To take away any letter, any word, any doctrine in the gospel, to replace it with another, to dumb down the gospel, to soften the gospel, is to bring a curse upon yourself. Whether you're an angel or an apostle or some TV evangelist, to preach any other gospel is to bring an eternal curse upon yourself. Someone asked me about how to witness, how do I witness the Jehovah Witnesses? This is what I do. Remember what I said yesterday? Give somebody enough rope and they'll hang themselves. And you have to do it this way. If you don't do it this way, they'll sneak out of it. I'll say, sir, I'm a Christian. So you obviously know there are things we are not going to agree on. But here's what I would ask of you. Tell me your gospel. Tell me the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so they say, well, I'd be glad to. So they start talking about the kingdom and principles and kingdom and this and that and all kinds and sorts of things. Not the kingdom in a biblical way. They'll start talking about all that type of stuff. And when they finish, I goes, now, sir. Could you share that with me again? Because I want to make sure I understand. I let them share it again. Same thing. And then I go, OK, sir, now I've heard it twice. I'm going to repeat it back to you to make sure that I fully understand your gospel. OK, does goes back and forth there, that back and tell them. And now, is that it? Is that it? Have I understood your gospel correctly? And he goes, yes. OK, let's go to first Corinthians 15. That he that he. Bore our sin. That he died, that he rose again from the third day on the third day, sir, you didn't share that with me. Well, well, that's it. Yeah, I said, no, no, that's why I asked you three twice and I repeated it back to you. You did not tell me the gospel. Your gospel is different from this gospel that I just read from the page of the Bible, and I can even do it in your Bible. You did not share that gospel with me. Let's go to Galatians chapter one. I look at him and usually he's with a disciple, right? I said, do you realize what your master's leading you into? You heard with your own ears. He did not share the gospel with me. He is under a curse and so are you. If you continue in this path. And, and you need to know this. There are evangelicals that are under a curse. They call themselves evangelicals and they are under a curse. Because they are not preaching the gospel.
And so we need to know what the gospel is. We need to know what the gospel is. Let's go to Galatians so that we seal this. Look in Galatians chapter 1. The Galatians had started well, and it seems that someone had intersected them, cut them off, caused them to stumble, and they were beginning to embrace another gospel, a distortion of the gospel. And Paul says in verse 8, but even if we are an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. So we have said before, so I am. Uh, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you receive, he is to be accursed. For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Now, a lot of times that that portion of, you know, we don't continue reading after verse nine, but I want you to be very careful to see the context here. As soon as he talks about these men being accursed, he said, for am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? And what I'm trying to get across here and what I think we see in this text is that whenever someone is trying, whenever someone distorts the gospel, it's to remove the scandal from it. It's to please men. And it can even be to please men for a so-called good reason. You know, like we mentioned just recently, Joel Olstein, where he's not going to talk about sin. If he doesn't talk about sin, he can't talk about the gospel. He can't. It's impossible. Because Christ died for sin. Men are sinners. Men must repent. Men must believe. Do you see that? But see, you can get around repentance and faith. Evangelicals do it every day. Many of the tracts that are handed out do it every day. There's no mention of repentance and faith. There's only if you want to be saved, pray this prayer and ask Jesus to come in. That's not biblical. It's not found in church history. It's just a modern invention of contemporary evangelicals. And many of you have used those tracks. Many of you have said that and told people to do the same. I have too. But when you begin to study the scriptures, you realize it's not the gospel. It's not the gospel. Now, we only have about an hour. So I'm going to have to just hit on certain aspects that I want you to see. And, and these are so important. If you were here for the two messages I preached on the cross. You will understand something. One is. The gospel doesn't begin with man. The gospel begins with God. You've probably said this before and thought it. We all have. Um, the problem is our sin. The problem is our sin. Well, part of that's true, but it's not entirely true. What do I mean? Let me put it this way. The problem is God. You say, what do you mean the problem's God? Well, let me, let me, let's say that I'm a mafioso. I'm a criminal, murderer. And I'm standing before a judge. Do I have a problem? Well, that depends on the judge. If the judge is a wicked criminal, I don't have a problem. Do I? See, our sin would not be a problem if God were not righteous. See, in your gospel, you've got to explain to people who God is. And there was a time probably in New Zealand and a time definitely in Europe and the United States when if you mentioned sin, the people had a sense of what that meant and they had a sense of why sin is bad. That's not today. It's not. Because God it, today, if someone believes in God, he's an Oprah Winfrey type God. He's just a grandfather who kind of like Santa Claus, who just loves everybody and and, and we're, we're just confused. You say you got to start at the very beginning of who God is. And one of the things to do is say, you know, let's talk about God, sir. Since I don't have a lot of time, I'm just going to share with you some of the ways that I evangelize. 
I go, Let, let's just begin talking about God. Let me ask you a question. Would you want God to be righteous or wicked? And usually the answer, well, righteous. Yeah, I said, I mean, you wouldn't want an omnipotent Hitler running around, would you? You'd want a righteous God. Because if he wasn't righteous, you couldn't trust in him. You wouldn't know. He could just dash you against a rock. He could, I mean, he could be evil. I mean, it would be horrific if there was an omnipotent creator and sustainer of the universe who was evil. So you say righteous is a good thing. Yes, it's good. OK, well, God is righteous. Let's go look at some texts. Go in the book of Psalms, chapter 11, chapter 7. God's righteous. He's a righteous God. He loves righteousness. So that's wonderful. But then do you see, sir, it also presents a problem? Well, how does it present a problem? Well, you and I aren't righteous. We're not righteous. So what does a righteous God do with people like us? And see, what I've done is, remember what I've taught this week about the central issue and heart of the gospel is that if God's righteous, he can't forgive you. You see that? He can't just cover sin. He can't. And he's not like the evangelist who says, you know, instead of being righteous with you or just with you, God was loving. No, because that's saying God's love is unjust. Or that God has something other than harmony in his attributes, that he's kind of a conflictive God. But he's not. When the theologian says that God is perfect, he means not only that he's without sin, but that he's perfect in all his attributes. There's not the abuse of one over the other. He's just and loving. So see, this is what the gospel's all about, sir. That God really is righteous and man really is sinful. And then a lot of times people say, but men aren't that sinful. And that's when, what do we do? Just like in, in biblical counseling or anything else, we amass our evidence. Just like a prosecuting attorney, but a prosecuting attorney with love. Just like that physician that I talked about, you know, put all that evidence in front of my mother so that she would be convinced. In the same way, we use the Word of God. And we start, you know, I start... I start even in the book of Genesis. Chapter eight. Genesis chapter six, even. That every thought of their heart was continually evil. And I'll have people say to me, I'll make statements like that because I know it will kind of, whoa, hold it. I'm not like, and I go, sir, if I could take out your heart right now and put it on a DVD and show it here to everybody on the airplane, everything you've ever thought would you not say, sir, that you'd try to get a parachute and jump off this airplane? Or would you say that you would never want to show your face here again to any of these people? Because, sir, you've thought things so twisted you could not share them with your closest friend. As a matter of fact, if your closest friend even knew the thoughts you've had about him or her, they wouldn't be your friend anymore. See, the thing is, is to use the scripture to use every means to show people this is really true, sir. You know, I've, I've gone from everything to, sir, if men are not sinful, why do we have governments? Why do we have laws? If men are not sinful, why is there continual war? Why do you think the things you think? Why have you done the things you've done? Why have you lied, sir? And so it's it's using the scriptures to show that what God says about man is true. And that's one of the greatest apologetics for Christianity. I mean, defenses of Christianity in this sense. It is the only viewpoint that takes into consideration what's really going on and gives an explanation for it. Let's just look at at let's just look at. Islam for a second. Does it deal with the sin of man. No, it really doesn't. How can I say that? Because it's a works religion. Does it deal with the holiness of God? Not really, not at all. Why? Because it's a works religion. What do I mean? If man can do imperfect works, if all men can sin and still be reconciled to God, 
without some sort of sacrifice, then there's two possibilities. One, God is not really that righteous. Or two, man is not really that sinful. But the Bible says, no, hold it. God really is righteous. Man really is sinful. You want God to be righteous. You don't want Him any other way. You really are sinful. Now, how can a righteous God be reconciled to sinful men? Well, the person might say, you can repent. He can ask for forgiveness. Well, sir, even our own law proves that's not true. Well, what do you mean? If I'm speeding down the road and a policeman pulls me over and is ready to write me a ticket and I say, sir, put your ticket book away. You don't need to write me a ticket because I promise not to do this again. You've already done it. Or I say, well, you know, I haven't murdered anybody. No, but you've embezzled and you still must go to prison. You see, it, it's just using what you know from Scripture, studying these matters to be a good evangelist, seeking to discover all the truth you can about man. And then one of the things that an evangelist does is he either learns from others or he sits down and says, OK, this is what the text says. How can I make it more and more clear? What illustrations can I use without be, with being very careful? Because sometimes your illustrations can be so flamboyant that they pull away from the word of God. And you don't want to do that because the word of God is what contains the power. So with everything you're wanting to just press upon them, God is righteous and you're not prove that God is righteous by the scriptures, prove that we are not by the scriptures and say, OK, here we are with this problem. Now let's talk about the love and mercy of God, what God has done to save men rather than what men can do to save God. Or to save themselves. Now. And that's when we start talking about the incarnation, the Christ event. The cross. Man has sinned, a man must die. The blood of bulls and goats will not take away our sin. The one who dies for us must be man. He must be of our stock. He must be of our bloodline. He must be one with us. And so God becomes man. But the one who also dies, he must be God. Why? Several reasons. If he was just a man or even an angel, from where would his life come? Would his life be his own? It wouldn't, would it? His life would be a gift from God. All the life of every creature is borrowed life, isn't it? Only God possesses life. Christ said, I have authority to lay my life down. It was his life. It wasn't borrowed breath. His life he laid down. The one who died there had to be a perfect sacrifice, which means not only had to be sinless, but of infinite value. A lot of times when you hear about his perfect sacrifice, the theologian is also talking about his infinite value. Extraordinary, immeasurable value. I've heard Christian songs that say, you know, God looked all over and couldn't find a man who would die or a man who was worthy. He looked into heaven and he couldn't. No angel would. That's silly. All the angels in all of heaven could have died for us and we'd still be going to hell. The one who died there had to be of infinite value. Here's another thing you need to think about. The wrath of God. It melts mountains so that they run down the slopes like water. It dries up seas. Who can stand before his indignation, his wrath? Who can bear with his continual burnings? When you talk about Christ on the cross as the God man, here's something that I want you to see. He had to be deity. To bear such an ordeal. But there's a way of looking at it that's very important. Christ had to suffer the wrath of God as man. 
if he was able to do that because of his deity also, and you're saying that the deity therefore deflected the wrath or made the wrath less, you're wrong. But what most theologians, especially the Puritans, would say was this, that Christ suffered the wrath of God as a man, which as a man, it would have pulverized him in a matter of a second. But his deity came under him and sustained him and held him up and caused him to be able to endure for hours what would have disintegrated him in a matter of a second. So as a man, he wasn't being protected by the deity. He was being forced up and held there and sustained so that he could bear it in its fullness. Do you see that? He died suffering the wrath of God in our place. And sir, when he said it is finished, it was paid in full. The justice of God that demanded your Eternal separation from God in hell under the wrath of God. The, that justice, its demands were fully satisfied when the Son of God died on that tree. Now, sir, not one drop of wrath is left for those who believe in Christ because Christ paid it all on that tree. And on the third day, he rose again from the dead. Now we're getting over into Romans 4, 24 and 25. Let's look at that text for just a second. It's somewhat difficult and there's debate about the text. But I'm going to go with the majority opinion. If you look in Romans 4, 25, he who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. Now, I believe that what this is saying is simply this. The fact that God raised his son from the dead is proof that his death fully satisfied the demands of justice and men can now be justified. His resurrection is God's public declaration that Christ's death satisfied the justice against us and everything was paid. He was raised and he ascended up to the right hand of God. And in no other name may someone be saved except through the name of Jesus. There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Only faith in Him. And now, sir, God calls all men everywhere not to pray a prayer and ask Jesus into their heart. God calls all men everywhere to repent of their sins and believe the gospel. To repent of their sins and believe the gospel. Now, Let's talk for a moment about. About repentance, I want you to look in Mark, let's go to Mark real quick. Look in chapter one. Verse 14. Now, after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Both being present tense imperatives. Indicating something of a continuous action. I'd like to say it this way. Jesus has died, has risen from the dead, is seated at the right hand of God. Now God commands you to spend the rest of your life repenting and believing. Now, why do I say it this way? I meet countless people that when I ask them about their salvation, this is they always speak in past tense. Yeah. Uh huh. Oh, don't worry about me. Yeah, I, I, I repented and I believed I done did that. You done did what? Well, I did that. I repented. I believed. Really? 
the evidence that you repented unto salvation years ago is that you're still repenting today. The evidence that you believed unto salvation several years ago is you're still believing today. But because preachers have so wrongly preached the gospel and invited men to Christ, they think that because one at one moment in their life they repented and they believed and they now continue on living in the world like the devil that they're saved, that that saved them. It did not save them. Not at all. And I'm not saying they lost their salvation. I'm saying that their way of life proves they never had it. The evidence that you're converted is that you're still repenting and believing. And not only that, you're growing in repentance and you're growing in faith because both of those things are also Christian virtues. You're being sanctified in your repentance. For example, when I was converted, I knew I was a sinner. But now after 30 some years, I sure know more about what that means. I'm more wounded today about my sins, even my previous sins, than I were when they came to my mind at the moment of my conversion. Do you see that? Do you see? Now think about the absurdity of this. I have had ministers call me publicly a false prophet and a heretic, and their counter is this. What you need to understand is if they repented and they believed that moment, and they trusted in Christ and they asked Christ to come in their heart. Christ saved them even if now they're atheists. You know what the problem is? They don't understand the doctrine of regeneration. And that's why I begin with that. You see that he who began a good work in you will finish it. OK. Now, I want, to, I want you to think for a moment. All right, we tell a man to repent and we need to be very, very careful here, not in telling them to repent, but in making them understand what that means, because I've had people think it means. Um, OK, and, and look at it this way. This is why some evangelicals say vehemently repentance is not a part of the gospel at all. It's just faith, not repentance. And, and they're saying it for a good reason, because they're trying to protect the doctrine of salvation by grace alone. But they're wrong. See, here's what they're thinking. Repentance means that you stop doing everything wrong and believe. And if you define it that way, yeah, that's a work salvation. <laughs> to be saved, you've got to do two things. You've got to stop doing everything wrong and you've got to believe. That's not what repentance is. Now, it will lead to that to some degree. Repentance is something of a change of mind. OK, and I want to give you an example of what that means. Paul, the apostle thought. Thought Saul of Tarsus thought in his head, he truly believed what that Jesus of Nazareth was a false prophet a false messiah and a blasphemer. He truly believed that those who followed him were blasphemers worthy of condemnation and death. He thought that, didn't he? he? That's what he believed. He believed that in his mind. And what did he do? He blasphemed Christ and he chased down Christ's followers. That's what he thought. On the road to Damascus, he has an encounter with the resurrected Jesus. And what happened? He changed his mind. Now, look at this. He realized he was wrong about everything that mattered. He was wrong about everything. It's like it's like the Matrix. It's like you waking up in the morning and, and sky's green, grass is blue, flowers grow downward instead of upward, people walk backwards. Everything you thought that was true is not. That was his, that's how radical it was for Paul. He's standing there and he realizes the one that he hated more than anyone else on the planet was actually God's Messiah, the hope of Israel. And he realized 
that him thinking that he was persecuting the most vile sect and then in one second he realizes he is persecuting the people of the living God, the people of the Messiah. What happened? His mind changed. And so did everything else. So did everything. He realized he was wrong about everything. And that change of mind led to a completely different style of life. Do you see that? It is not just letting go of one little sin here and one little sin there and this and that, but it's the high de your whole paradigm shift. Let's take this uh, a young girl. She's she's 21 years old. She's going to modeling school. She spends 23 hours out of 24 looking in the mirror. She wants to have plastic surgery. She wants to be the most beautiful woman who ever walked the planet. And all she can think about is people adoring her. That's her life. That's what she thinks. That's what everything is about. And one day, she's sitting on a bus beside this little girl, with the Bible open, who begins to share with her. And she realizes what? Is it any different than the Apostle Paul? No. I have been wrong about everything. My life is vain and stupid and sinful and full of self idolatry. Now, does that mean at that moment, even at her salvation, that from then on she's perfect? No, it realizes it means that there is a tremendous paradigm shift that even after she's saved is going to cause a struggle and a war between her flesh's desire for vanity and her desire to be obedient. But you are going to see a changed human being who is now broken when they do the things that used to make them happy. They're living in a completely different paradigm shift. Everything has changed. A businessman, all he thinks about... He doesn't care about his wife. He just hands her some money. All he cares about is money, money, money. He slaughters his, his own partners. He doesn't care about anything. He's a wicked man. He lies on his taxes, everything else. And one day, he goes into a restaurant and someone had left a track and he picks it up and starts reading it. I'm wrong about everything. You see? And yes, it filters down to the individual sins and everything else. But it is, and only God can do this. God turns on the light and you see you're wrong about everything. And the things that you once loved, you now hate. The things that you once hated, you now loved. The things you once boasted of, you're now ashamed of. It's a work of God. And so when I tell people, you must repent, and they say, how do I know if I've repented? I say, well, let's look at your heart. Are you hating the sin you once loved? Are you ashamed of the sin you once repented of? The things you once ran to that were vile in the sight of God, do you now seek to be rid of them? The God you once ignored and didn't care for, do you now desire and do you seek him? You see? Rather than and see, in my wake, when I die, I'm not going to leave a bunch of people that say I'm saved and going to heaven because 20 years ago, I prayed a prayer with Paul Washer. And that's what most evangelists are doing. And then I look at them and I say, believe. Believe. What does it mean? You have no hope except the person and work of Christ. In your heart, you have had every hope of reconciliation with God ripped out of your heart. You hope in nothing but Christ and what He did for you on that tray. Now, usually when that happens, a lot of times I've had people say, I do, I do. I'm not going to sit there and say you're saved. Preacher, listen to me. You have the authority to tell people how to be saved. 
you have the authority to show them the biblical principles with regard to assurance of salvation. You do not have the authority to tell people they're saved. You don't go to them and tell them you're saved. They come to you because of the work of the Holy Spirit and they tell you they're saved. Do you see that? But a lot of times I'll say, you just must believe. But a person will do this, they'll go, and they're sincere. And it's in the midst of this struggle. And they'll go, but I see that. I mean, I, I, I see that, but I just don't. I just don't know if I believe I just what are you going to do then, huh? Because you need some closure, don't you? So you're going to try to. I'm going to help them now. They don't see it, so I need to give them something that's going to give them some. I know what. All right. Well, just just call on the Lord with me and and just ask him. Did you ask him sincerely? Yes, I did. Well, then you're you're ruining everything. Stop it. Stop it. From where does faith come? Faith that someone else doesn't have to tell you you have. Where does it come from? It comes from the scriptures, the promises. When I'm with a person like that and they're going, my heart is broke. I want this and I see that it's just Jesus, but I'm just. I'm not going to give them a human aid or human crutch to lean on. I'm not going to popishly proclaim them to be born again so that they'll have some peace. What am I going to do? I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to open up the Bible and I'm going to go through every gospel promise I know with them. And I'm going to tell them to read it with me. And I'm going to tell them to pray with me. Because faith is birthed from the promises of God. Not from some little finagling I can do. Do you see that? Let me give you an example. This is one of the most precious moments of my life that I'm going to share with you. This was. It was one of the most glorious things that's ever happened to me. I was preaching up in Canada, just a few kilometers from Alaska. And it there were more honest, there were more grizzly bears than people. There were, that's what they told me. And I'm in a church of about maybe 20 people. And I'm preaching and right when I get up to preach, the back doors open up and this mountain of a man walked in. He was probably 65, 70. He could have whipped everybody in this room. He was just a mountain of a man and he just came in. And he sat down on the front row, just I've never seen a human being that sad in all my life. And so I just forgot about it. I'm preaching the gospel. So I preached the gospel for an hour and he just sat there and looked. And then I went down and I said, sir, what's wrong with you? I've never seen a man like you. What's troubling you, sir? He pulled out a manila envelope. This really happened with x-rays on it. And he said. Just went to the doctor. I'm going to die. In like weeks. I'm going to die. I said, did you understand the message? He said, yes, I did. But is that it? And I understood it. The child could have understood what you were saying. Now, what would most evangelists do? And this is why I get so mad. What they've done, I'll tell you exactly what they've done because I've been there when they've done things like that. Well, sir, you want to pray and ask Jesus into your heart? So that if he does that, then they can now pronounce him saved. I said, all right, sir. I got to fly out of here tomorrow. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to sit here with you and we're going to go over scripture and we're going to pray together. I'll cancel my flight tomorrow. We're going to sit here and we're going to go through scripture until either you come to know the Lord or I watch you die and go to hell. Is it a deal? He said, yeah. So I asked him about the message. He did. He understood it. Understood what Christ had done. But he kept saying, is that just it? I, I understand it. I mean, it's a story that I mean, a child could. And he had also told me previously, he said, look, I've never been in a church in my life. I've never read a Bible. I heard one time about somebody who was telling me about some man named Jesus. He said, all I know is I've lived on a cattle ranch all my life. All I know is there is a God 
And I ain't never been afraid of anything, but I'm afraid to die and stand before Him. And so we started. And we would go through the promises. I mean, don't just think promises in the New Testament. Promises in the Old Testament. Promises in Psalms. Promises in Isaiah. Promises that those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Just promises. He who believes. He who believes. And it went on for about an hour. An hour and a half. He'd read them. We'd talk about them. He'd pray. He'd read some more. We'd just go through promises. We'd gone through John 3.16 once or twice already because it's my favorite verse in the whole Bible. And then we're sitting there. I said, sir, let's go back to John 3.16. And I'll never forget. He had my Bible on his lap and those big hands. I have big hands, but his were like thick, big hands. And he said, well, isn't that I mean, didn't we? I said, yeah, let's just I want you to read John 316. It's a promise. And he looked down at that. And he goes, OK, OK. For God. So loved the world. And then I saw him do this. He's going. That he gave his only son. <laughs> And he goes, oh, I'm saved. I'm clean. I'm clean. I have eternal life. I'm saved. I have no fear. I'm saved. I'm clean. I said, how do you know? He said, haven't you ever read this verse before? That, that really happened. Do you see what happened? The Holy Spirit did exactly what He promised to do if we would just be biblical and stop all those little asinine methodologies we have. He used the Word of God. He illuminated. He regenerated the man's heart. He illuminated his mind. He saw the Scriptures. And I didn't have to tell him he would be saved because he prayed the prayer if he was sincere enough. He was telling everybody, come now, my wife's right over here. You've got to come. You've got to tell her this. I got to tell her this. I'm saved. I'm... The next morning I went and visited him again. He's just glowing. I'm going home. I'm going home. I always tell people tell me, you know, Brother Paul, I wish it was like, you know, those old guys write in the books about how God would just do things just so supernatural, you know, hear about the Puritans and all these guys and David Brainerd and the great revival in New England and the spirit of God. I just wish that would happen. I said, well, maybe it would if you'd start doing what they did. If you would quit all this silly stuff and realize you're in a valley of dead bones. And behold, they are very dry. And all your little finagling and your cute little gimmicks and your... When someone asked me, you know, I want to be an evangelist. I want to be a missionary. What should I do? I said, don't go into any classes on missions or evangelism. That's the first thing you should do. Because they're going to give you a methodology. Look at this. You open up the track. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Try telling that to the people in Noah's day. Maybe you should put that on the side of the ark while they're all swimming around it. With a smiley face. The statement in itself may be not wrong, but it, unless correctly explained, you've got. I walk up to a, a man who's a drunk and a pedophile and rapes his daughter every, every morning, and I walk up to him, put my arm around him, and say, Sir, God loves you just like you are. Really? 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 Because I've heard people do that. Really? If I had a dime for every evangelist I heard start his sermon saying, the first thing I want you people to know 
is that God is not an angry God. Then I come. I'm the next guy up. First thing I want you to know is God is indignant with the wicked every day. And He has sharpened His arrows. He's bent His bow. And if you don't repent, He's going to send you straight to hell. Do you see that? See, what the sinner needs to know, even the pedophile, is this. God hates his sin, and there's a real way in which God hates him. He is an object of God's hatred. Psalms 5, 5. You know, God loves the sinner and hates the sin. You really need to read the Bible. Because the Bible says, God hates the sinner. God hates all those who do wrong. Now, how do we explain that in light of John 3, 16? First of all, you've got to understand something. They're both in the Bible. So they both need to be understood in light of one another. And what does it mean? We were talking about this last night. Let's take every sin since Adam. Every child raped. Every country starved to death for some political reason. Every unjust war. Everything that's ever gone on. And do you honestly think God is just sitting there going, well, okay, sirrah, sirrah. Can you imagine the indignation that has been stored up? He is angry with the wicked every day. You're angry when you hear a story about a little boy that's been raped, aren't you? Well, God sees every one of them every day. And the wicked need to know that God's indignation, His holy wrath is burning against them. And yet at the same time, His love is like this. While God's wrath burns against them, with one hand, God's mercy holds back God's wrath. And with the other hand, mercy beckons the sinner to come. But one day, both hands will be pulled back. And for the sinner, there'll be nothing but the wrath of God. And so I will walk up to that man. And I will say, sir. There is a God of love. Who has a love beyond anything anyone could ever imagine, but that God is also righteous and the things that you are doing because of them, his indignation burns against you. Repent, throw yourself on the mercy of God before it is too late, because one day he will withdraw his hands and there will be nothing left for you but the holy, eternal hatred of God against you. And in the in the same measure that he delights to save some, he will delight in condemning you. Now repent and believe the gospel. You see? But we start off this track. Now imagine, I don't know, you people from New Zealand and Australia are probably not as superficial as us in the United States. You're probably not that way. So I'll use the United States as an example. You walk up to a secular man in the United States and you say this, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. And he goes, what? What? God, God loves me? God loves me? And has a wonderful plan for my life? That's great! I love me too! And I got all kinds of wonderful plans for my life! And you say if I, like I join Him, He's going to help me become everything I'm supposed to be? Yeah? That's what preachers are saying. I can give you names and you'll know them. But sir, there's a problem. What's the problem? You're a sinner. You're a sinner. OK. What do I what do I need to do to get this going here? You see? Well, sir. The Bible says you're a sinner. Do you agree with that? Uh-huh. Now think about that. He agrees with it. He doesn't even understand what's being told to him. You're a sinner. Because in modern day evangelicalism, it's kind of like you got the flu. You're a victim of society. You're confused. You've done some things wrong, but you're not really a bad person. You're a sinner. But if he says he's a sinner, yeah, I'm a sinner. Well, then would you like to go to heaven? 
That's the next question. Would you like to go to heaven? Uh huh. I mean, who's going to, you know, who's going to, no, I'd rather go to hell. You see, that's what utopia is about. That's what philosophy is about. It's what government's about. Utopia. You see, everybody wants to go to heaven. They just don't want God to be there when they get there. Several years ago, it was amazing. With Robin Williams, they made a film, What, made, what Dreams May Come. It's about him, the doctor. He dies and he goes to heaven. You know what's amazing about that film? When he gets to heaven, he says, where's God? And the angel goes, he's up there. So Hollywood not only removed him from the earth, he's now removed from heaven. Everybody wants heaven. They just don't want a righteous God. So when you ask him if he wants to go to heaven, you, you haven't. He hasn't said anything when he says yes. If you ask him if he's a sinner and he says yes, he hasn't said anything. If you ask him if he wants to go to heaven and he says yes, he hasn't said anything. It means nothing. So the question is, sir, instead of saying God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, tell him who God really is. And then, sir, the Bible says you're a sinner. Let me show you what that means and in what kind of relationship that puts you with God. And then, sir, the question is not whether or not you want to go to heaven. The question is, do you want God? Do you want God? And the question is not, do you realize you're a sinner? The question is, has God so worked in your heart while I'm sharing you the gospel that you now hate the sin you once loved and love the righteousness you once hated? Has there been a change in your heart? And then, sir, do you understand faith? And I will take you through the scriptures. Now listen to this. Not until you pray a prayer. I will take you through the scriptures and labor with you until Christ is formed in you. Until the Holy Spirit himself using the scriptures affirms to you that you have genuinely been saved by God. And then, sir, as an evangelist. Like the great heart of Pilgrim's Progress, I am not going to leave you there with just assurance, but I'm going to give you gospel warnings. Sorry. When someone comes to me after a meeting and says, I have been born again, I'm saved. I don't say, no, you haven't. I'm not going to crush out the light that's there. I'm going to say, wonderful, wonderful. But now, let's look at your repentance. Does it line up with Scripture? Let's look at your faith. Does it line up with Scripture? And then I may say, you know, this is amazing. It seems like God's done a work in you. Wonderful. But now, I must let you know something about the final peg of assurance. And what's that? If you walk out of here tonight and you return back to your old life and you stay there, nothing happened to you tonight. But the evidence that you have repented and believed unto salvation is that you're going to walk out of here and you're going to walk out of here and walk into a newness of life. And that does not mean you're going to be perfect. That does not mean that you're not going to have struggles. It may be two steps forward and one step back. It may be cataclysmic failure with progress. But I'm going to tell you this. The one who began a good work in you will finish it. You will begin to grow in sanctification. You will begin to change and become more conformed to Christ because the evidence of justification is ongoing sanctification. And you know what I've just said? First John. Now, isn't this amazing? Now, I want you to think about this. And I wish I could literally I need to do like eight lectures for just the little things we're talking about here. But I want you to think about this. Someone comes to a pastor. And this tells you how low, how low we've, we've become. Some young kid comes to a pastor and says, I don't know if I'm saved. And the pastor says, well, well, I was there when you prayed and asked Jesus to come into your heart. He goes, yeah, but I, I'm just, I'm just, I don't know if I'm saved. And so the pastor says, well, let me ask you a question. When you prayed and asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart, 
were you sincere? And the child says, or the adult says, well, I, I, I think so. Well, then you're saved. This is just the devil bothering you. Now, how many times have I heard that? How many? That is horrific. Horrific. Heresy and soul damning is what that is. I know everybody practices it. But what we're doing is, OK, child. I'm going to tell you to have assurance based upon your own interpretation of how sincere you were at a particular moment in your life. Now, does that sound very good to you? I want you to base your eternal security upon your opinion of how sincere you were when you prayed a prayer one time. Does that really sound right to you? That's pitiful. What do you do? I'll tell you what the old guys did. It's called the book of first John and no one even knows this. I go teach at seminaries and they don't know this. Why was first John written? These things I wrote. Why to whom to those who believe? Why that they may know that they have eternal life and John first John is a series of tests by which you compare your life to those tests. Not in a legalistic manner. It's just basically this. A believer is going to have a certain kind of lifestyle. And if your life isn't conforming to these tests, then you need to seriously, seriously wrestle with the fact of whether or not you've been truly converted. That's what first John is about. And it's not a works righteousness. It's simply saying this. If you have been converted, a couple of things are going to happen that ensure there's going to be evidence. First of all, a changed nature, a new heart. Second of all, the providence of God. Hebrews chapter 12. If you're a child, he's not going to let you run wild in the world. So many pastors are accusing God of being a derelict father, derelict and loveless. Because they're saying he's got all these children running around in the world and he doesn't do anything to them. All these children living in sin, immorality, watching pornography, everything you can imagine. They claim to be his children. The pastor says they are. And yet God doesn't discipline them. The Bible says if you're without discipline, you're an illegitimate child. Why is it that one believer can commit a small indiscretion and it seems like both in his heart and in his practical life, all hell breaks loose and he's disciplined severely. And yet another so-called believer can live in fornication, adultery, pornography and everything else and go to church on Sunday and everything's cool. I'll tell you, because one of them actually belongs to God. Jacob, I loved Esau, I hated. Now, in Hebrew, that means Jacob, he loved and Esau, he hated. But what does it mean? Because when you look at Esau's life, God fulfilled every promise with Esau that he gave. And Esau was so prosperous when Jacob returned back into the promised land that he didn't need anything Jacob wanted to give him. So how is it that God showed hatred towards Esau and love towards Jacob? He showed hatred towards Esau and that he let Esau be Esau. We never have one case of God disciplining Esau. And yet he beat Jacob half to death every day of his life. Do you see that? He transformed Jacob. And that's what he does with every one of his children. Do you see that? And so we go through first John and that's what it's that's what it's all about, brothers. The whole thing is a series of tests. Dr. MacArthur, I think, has a booklet on it or it may be in the study Bible. I think I've even seen evidences of a believer. OK, evidences of a believer. And what's amazing, it starts out and it says, you know, God is light. And in him, there is no darkness. And, and a lot of people say, well, that means God's holy. Well, it does. But I believe in this context, there's the idea of revelation going on. What do I mean? 
There were a group of teachers that believed that God was esoteric and dark and you couldn't know him and you couldn't know his will. John writes to these believers and he says, no, 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 that's not true. God has shown you who he is and he has shown you his will. He's light. He's revealed it to you. You know it. It's in the teachings we gave you. God is light. He has revealed his character to us and his will to us. And how do you know you're a believer? Because you walk in the light of what he has revealed about his will and his person. And how do you do that? Through the scriptures. Now, when it talks about walk, it's talking about a style of life. It's not talking about a perfect life. It's not talking about perfect obedience or perfect conformity. It's but you know the difference, don't you? You see a person walking out in the world claims to be a Christian, but he has nothing to do with God's revelation, doesn't understand it, doesn't really care, goes to church on Sunday, but does not seek, does not try, does not attempt, does not strive to walk in the light and doesn't walk in the light. He walks in a way that contradicts what the Bible teaches about who God is and what God wants for us. And John says, if you walk that way, you can have no assurance that you've ever come to know him. But then what's amazing, after talking about conformity to the scriptures, he then talks about sin. And here's just shows how wise the Bible is. If we say we have no sin, what? We're liars. And so not only is one of the characteristics of a true believer is that he walks in what God has told us. He seeks to conform his life to what God has told us about his will and about his person. But he's also a person. This believer, not a perfect person, he's someone who acknowledges his own sin and it leads him to a life of confession. Do you see that? Confession, homo logeo, means homo, the same, logeo, speak, to speak the same thing. When the scriptures tell you, you were just impatient with your wife, homo logeo is not, confession is not forgive me. Confession is when you speak the same thing. God, what you say about me is true. I was impatient with my wife. Forgive me. The Christian, the true Christian will recognize sin in their life and will confess it. And that'll be a practice you will see in the true Christian's life. You see? Isn't it amazing? Because this has happened a lot in my life. I'll be preaching and there'll be a move of God in some church. You just people start weeping. And in some churches where they practice, you know, coming forward, I don't fight them about it. If they want to come forward or whatever. But people, you know, it's amazing. Almost every time that's happened, the holiest, most devout people in the church are the ones who are weeping and coming forward and confessing their sin. And the most wicked, dull heart.